Old School RuneScape was released in 2013. In the nine years since, it's received its fair share of infrastructure updates, right? Well, if you've played any time between 2013 and now, chances are you've probably noticed some lag spikes here and there. As it turns out, I guess more people than just myself have noticed. Take the Dead Man Reborn finals, for example. With tens of thousands of dollars on the line and a massive audience tuning in live for the finale, you know Jagex was ready to put on an airtight show for publicity and show their participants the respect they deserve for grinding hundreds of hours to qualify for the 1v1 tournament. In case you forgot, here's how that went. He's not able to go for those VLSs, and he's been on Frozen here going for it, but unfortunately, <laughs> having a little bit of a lag issues a little bit of stuttering right now yeah it is it really looks like the uh, the players yeah. are suffering at the moment which does is most likely in skill specs favor actually here i just want to quickly mention i've had a message come through from the jagex team uh, the old school mods and they want to just let you know that the teams uh, have been and are continuing to investigate the cause of the lag and will update you when we have more to share with so much on the line everyone was left asking how could this possibly happen and do you know what? That's a great question. We never really got an answer to that, did we? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've got answers. As it turns out, not only am I a nerdy 2100 total Ultimate Iron Man, I'm also a nerdy professional software engineer. Although I'm no network security expert, my college senior thesis was about mitigating denial of service tax on enterprise networks. I did my research, published it, and like many college graduates, never use that knowledge again. But today, it finally pays off. Today, I explain what's causing these lag spikes, why Jagex hasn't fixed their servers yet, and what they can do to solve this problem. Before I get started, for all of the IT network engineer nerds out here watching this video that will be angrily screaming at my explanation, Guys, not everyone watching this is a huge geek like us, all right? I've got to tone down the nitty gritty tech talk just a little bit so that the audience doesn't fall asleep. So bear with me, okay? With that out of the way, first things first, we need some background information. I can almost guarantee that everyone watching this video has heard the term denial of service attack. But what exactly does that mean? A denial of service or DOS attack is a network-based attack where a perpetrator attempts to overload a targeted machine, network, or service by flooding the mark with a high volume of illegitimate requests with the goal of rendering the targeted resource dysfunctional. It gets worse. A lot worse. Denial of service attacks on their own are actually not a very difficult problem to solve. DOS perpetrators need information to execute their attacks, specifically the IP address or addresses of the victim. Should someone find themselves undergoing a denial of service attack, neutralizing it is as simple as changing their IP address. My point is that denial of service attacks can be reasonably defeated. But Zort, you said it gets worse, so what's the problem? I'm so glad I asked. Meet DDoS. It's denial of service, but with an extra D. I usually love double Ds, but not this time. A DDoS, or distributed denial of service attack, is everything that its single D counterpart is, but instead of the perpetrator using a single machine to carry out the onslaught, the attack is distributed over a network of machines. Why does that matter? To put it simply, more machines equals more power. As it turns out, a lot more power. Companies like Netflix, Amazon, Twitter, and Google are a few examples of companies that battle with DDoS attacks on a regular basis and lose. If that doesn't surprise you, it should. These are web-based companies with billions of dollars at their disposal to enhance their security protocols and network infrastructure. How can it be possible that the biggest tech companies in the world with seemingly limitless financial resources can't solve this problem? Meet botnets, a collection of internet connected devices, each of which contributes to the overall computational power behind a DDoS attack. By chaining together a number of these devices, DDoS attack strength can be increased by an order of several magnitudes. Historically speaking, botnets were comprised primarily of workstations, in other words, PCs. There's two problems here though. 
The first is that PCs aren't cheap, at least not the good ones. But if someone really wants to level up their DDoS attack skill to 99, it's going to take a lot of computers, which translates to a lot of money. The good news? There's a solution. Just compromise other people's computers, drop your control script in, and you've got yourself a plus one for your botnet. Ah, but here's where problem number two comes in. As it turns out, compromising other computers on a mass scale is harder than it sounds. First, an attacker would need a method of delivering their payload or exploitative code to the victim. Next, that code would need to be executable on the target device, meaning the operating system has to be considered. Then throw modern antivirus into the picture, beatable, sure, but it's not a trivial hurdle to jump over. Finally, what if your friend Bob over in Lumbridge has already recruited the Lesser Demons PC into his botnet? Now you've got two botnets competing for the same resource, meaning less computational power for everyone. These reasons are a large part of why, for a long time, botnets were somewhat limited in their scale. But what if I told you that in the last 20 years, something new has entered the market that's allowed botnet owners to bypass nearly all of these concerns and grow their malicious networks tenfold? Well, it has. Enter your refrigerator. Sort of. Let me explain. In the modern age, more and more common household items have been enhanced to become smart devices that connect to the internet. This is mainly for convenience factor, giving customers a means of controlling their devices from their smartphones. Whereas computers are big, expensive, and people are educated on the value of having a system with strong security, the same can't be said for smart devices. Smart devices, or items that belong to the internet of things, are often manufactured with much less profit wiggle room. If your smart lights cost $20, it's a lot harder of a sell for the company producing them to invest $10 in bolstering security than it is for someone making a personal computer. What this results in is smart devices with very weak or sometimes completely absent security. Do you see where I'm going with this yet? If I were a botnet owner in today's day and age, why would I try to compromise workstations when they possess a significantly greater challenge to recruit than say, the smart fridge in your kitchen? Yes, the PC is stronger, but in the time that a workstation has been collected by the botnet, I could have added 40 fridges and your grandma smart speakers all without breaking a sweat. What all of this has resulted in is gigantic botnets popping up around the world comprised primarily of IoT devices possessing unbelievable power. Let's talk defenses. Defense number one, null routing. Think of this as banishing all DDoS traffic to the runecrafting mines forever. If the IP addresses of the attacker's machines can be identified, traffic from those devices can be flagged and thrown away when it's detected. Number two, work under the veil of a virtual private network or VPN. And there's no better VPN than today's sponsor. Just kidding, I'm too small of a channel for a sponsor. So instead, if you're enjoying today's video, a like or a subscription goes a long way since these episodes take a lot of time and effort to produce. Anyway, back to the video. Okay, the real number two, firewalls. Firewalls vary a little bit depending on if they're protecting a network or an application, but their general purpose is pretty similar to null routing. They prevent traffic that originates from specific filter criteria like regions or flagged IP addresses. Number three, rate-based IPS detection. Now we're getting somewhere. IPS or intrusion prevention systems analyze and scrub traffic data before it's allowed to reach its final destination. Although effective, this is expensive. Rate-based IPS is slightly different in that it focuses on analyzing traffic flow rather than traffic data. To give you an example, our IPS monitoring can usually detect a DDoS attack because there's an associated spike in traffic when it occurs. This allows service providers to configure thresholds for their systems to say, if we experience X level of traffic, throw up a red flag, or if we detect Y percentage of traffic over Z minutes, throw up a red flag. Defense number four, and the last one that I wanna bring up is upstream filtering. The process of this filtering depends on the provider, but I want you to picture a series of nets between an attacker's machine and their target. 
OneNet analyzes the traffic source, OneNet analyzes what the request is trying to access, and one analyzes if this is a new or repeat accessor. There's far more nets than that, but let's just stick with those examples. Passing through one of those nets might not be too hard, but clearing all of the checks as DDoS data is much more difficult. Of course, some malicious traffic will always make it through because the filters need to be lenient enough to allow valid requests through. So that's the first negative of upstream filtering. The second is that scrubbing data at each of the different nets is detrimental to performance and annoying to legitimate users. Here's the key though. What if we combine rate-based intruder prevention systems with upstream filtering? Now we only scrutinize data if we're dealing with a data volume level that is dangerously high for our system. That way, during normal times, there's no slowness introduced, then when a system is experiencing a DDoS attack, we can detect it, kick on the upstream filtering, and reduce the strength of the attack. This will come at the temporary cost of service slowness during the duration of the DDoS attack, but it will allow the service to remain online and functional for users until the attack ends and the filtering can be turned back off. I'm about to bring this full circle. The filtering process that I talked about that keeps the service online but slows it down, that creates a lot of the server lag that you experience in game. So how can Jagex get rid of that and provide silky smooth play experience for their members 24-7? They can't. I think that with a sizable investment, Jagex can make some much needed upgrades and also employ the services of DDoS mitigation professionals. As a big company with a large network, a lot of microservices, and a lot of code depending on internal static IP addresses, just change your IP is not going to cut it as a solution for Jagex. If billion dollar tech corporations can't defeat DDoS attacks, Jagex will never be able to. The big takeaway here though is that things could be a lot better. It's going to take a lot of time and money, but old school is quickly reaching a breaking point when it comes to server volatility, and the executive team at Jagex will have their hands forced to make the necessary upgrades in the near future. No longer are these attacks just quietly affecting regular players, but they're also reflecting poorly on Jagex as a company during public events like Deadman Mode and Leaks. The cost for them will soon be too high, and I'd venture to guess that the ball for upgrades and third-party DDoS defense services has already started rolling. If you're interested in more videos like this one, seeing some of the most unique accounts that RuneScape has to offer, Ultimate Iron Man content, or no looting bag UIM progress videos, please consider subscribing to help me grow my channel. I also really appreciate any likes on your way out, or even better, sharing the video on social media. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay kind. I will see you all in the next video.